Hello, good afternoon. My name is Adrini. I'm from the University of Toronto and I'm from the Roth Lab that used to be at UFT and now it's at University of Pittsburgh. And today I'm going to focus on one of my uh, projects that is the contextual variant effect testing of the AJXT gene. And as we all can appreciate, there is a crisis in variant interpretation or classification because the number of variants of uncertain significance is rising as more people get access to genetic testing, and that's something that needs to be addressed. So when a patient has a variant, uh, sometimes single variant fitness test is available, but we call this a reactive approach, and it might take too long, and patients might lose the window to which intervention could prevent uh, worse outcomes or even uh, allows for cascade screening. So we actually want to promote a new paradigm where we do proactive testing, when we test all possible variants of a gene in parallel in a multiplex way, even before the variant is found in patients. And therefore, with this strategy, I focus on testing human variants of the alanine glyoxylate aminotransferase gene that encodes the ADT protein. Oh, sorry, there's a problem here. So the ADT protein, it's important to metabolize glycine using glyoxylate and alanine. And here I have the monomer of the protein that has a PLP binding site that is 5-peroxidase phosphate that is the active form of vitamin B6. Is the cofactor of the protein that helps the protein works. And this protein is a dimer, and I highlighted here uh, two sites of this protein that around 3 to 30% of people have some polymorphisms. So the problem when uh, AGT is lacking in liver, liver peroxisomes, either because of a catalytic defect or aggregation, is that we see a buildup of oxalate that in, leads to oxalosis around throughout the whole body and leads to kidney damage. And this uh, set of features, it's named primary hyperoxaluria type 1 or PH1 and is a rare recessive disease and is a very harsh disease as most people will develop end of stage renal disease and they will need first a liver transplant and then a kidney transplant. Uh, and another form of AGT malfunction is mislocalization. So I'm showing here that the wild type protein, or we call the major allele protein, can fold, dimerize, and go 100% to the liver peroxisomes where it's supposed to be. But there's a minor allele mutation that I highlighted before that expose a mitochondria targeted sequence on this protein, and 5% of this protein goes to the mitochondria. And that doesn't necessarily lead to disease, but it sensitizes the protein to other mutations that will cause pH1. So in this example, uh, the, the variant in the residue 170 is one of the most for, for the one of the most common ones in pH1, and we see up to 90% of mislocalization. Therefore, I'm using an yeast-based selection where the four genes responsible for glycine metabolism were, were knocked out, and this yeast cannot make glycine. So it won't grow in media without glycine unless you either add back the human AJXT or the yeast AJX1. We validated this assay first in small scale, and because I mentioned that there is a very common minor allele, uh, we decided to test variants both in the wild type background or their major allele and the minor allele background. And we actually saw in small scale that the minor allele background had a good potential to have more uh, precision recall. Therefore, my job was to take this to the large scale and I use uh, large scale mutagenesis to test variants both in the wild type background, so in this case single mutants, and in the minor allele background there are triple mutants. And I also think it would be really interesting to see whether these mutations respond to vitamin B6 treatment because it's something recommended to patients. And so then, instead of just doing one MAVE, I decided to do four different maps in which I would test the response of the variants to PLP and whether they were worse in the minor allele background. So we used this uh, liquid selection in a pool, and I did uh, these four independent assays with triplicates, and based on the frequency that I found using our in-house software called, software called TioSeq, I was able to calculate fitness scores for each one of the variants in each one of the four conditions. 
And here are the four variant effect maps of HXT in the context of the major allele, so just single mutants, major allele plus uh, PLP, and then the minor allele, that is the third map with triple mutants, and the same uh, library tested in the presence of PLP. And I rescale these maps to the medium of the nonsense and synonymous in each one of their, these conditions. And overall, we have a very good coverage of these maps, and they do recapitulate non-biological information about the protein active sites, substrates. So everything that is dark blue is deleterious, and everything that is white is neutral-like. And we can see that PLP looks like it's helping for single mutants, but not necessarily for the minor allele background. And then, one of the validations that I needed to do after I had this data set is knowing if these four different maps could separate synonymous in blue and nonsense variants in red. So here I'm showing you uh, the fitness scores for this uh, variants and the mesense in the gray peaks in the uh, upside down uh, plots. And it's interesting how the mesense variants have a bimodal distribution sometimes uh, like synonymous, sometimes like nonsense, depending on the condition that was tested. Therefore, I calculated the precision and recall curve of each one of the maps to get to know which one of them were the best for clinical applications, and I compared the map scores that are in black with uh, the best uh, variant pathogenicity predictors. So in this case was Verity that was made in our lab that is in red, uh, ESM1 being green, and alpha mesense in blue. And indeed, the minor allele-based map had the best area under the precision recall curve, and it was significantly better than ESM1B. So then, after I knew that this map was the best one, I wanted to see if it could actually separate pathogenic and benign variants in the ClinVar database. So what I did is that I looked at the map with just single mutants in the left panel and the map with the triple mutants in the right panel, and I plot them based on the notation of variants in ClinVar. And the goal was to see which one could separate best the pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants, so the red and orange, and which ones would have the best separation for the benign and likely benign variants that are the blue ones. And the minor allele looks like it separates best, again, the pathogenic and benign variants. So then, with this uh, big data set, there are many applications that I could do, and I did a lot, a lot of analysis in each one of these fronts, and I will be able to highlight a couple of the most interesting results for you, but basically what I really wanted to do is provide new functional evidence for VUS reclassification, and I collaborated with um, cohorts of page one patients for that front. Second, I want to see what variants changed the most if uh, vitamin B6 was added or changed the most if it was on top of the minor allele. I also look at the stability of mutants, looking at delta-delta G predictions and also some small-scale stability uh, tests that were available in the literature. Then I looked at protein structure analysis because I was able to get fitness scores for disorder regions. And then uh, I also, uh, I'm still planning to look at the UK Biobank and phenotypes from the PH1 cohorts. So uh, now, looking at the clinical side of things, I calculated the log likelihood of pathogenicity uh, using the minor allele-based maps. And here, um, based on the benign variants that are in the databases that are in green and the pathogenic variants in red, I was able to assign levels of evidence, and it's very interesting that we didn't have vocabulary for this moderate variance for functional evidence, so we actually came up with our own uh, evidence codes with X, and uh, for each one of these uh, levels, uh, I was able to calculate LLRs for each missense variant. And using this, I looked at four different cohorts of uh, Vari uh, variants of AGXT, and I was able to class up to give evidence for 314 unique v VUSs. And it's really interesting that most of the variants, they are filtered because I took it out the, um, the variants that were um, ambiguous in between synonymous and nonsense are VUS, which makes sense because it's in between function. 
Uh, next, a very interesting finding that uh, I was able to have with this study is that I was looking at the correlation of the major allele background scores that are in black with the minor allele base scores that are in blue. And overall, they look the same. When is deleterious in one map, is deleterious in the other, but in one site that I highlighted there with the uh, arrows. And on that site, variants that look very deleterious in the wild type background do not look as deleterious in the minor little background. And indeed, looking at the PDB structure, I figure out that what is happening is that a residue that was super important in the wild type background, residue 281, is actually very neutral in the minor allele background. And that happens because the minor allele protein has the N-terminal uh, changed in a way that that residue is too far to hold the large domain together. So another variant, 373, actually take the place of that residue, and that's something that was not available in the literature. Finally, I just wanted to share some, uh, a story that is very interesting for phenotype uh, applications that there is this um, family that lost two babies at four months of age for the severe form of PH1 that will lead to end of renal, uh, end of renal disease by one year of age. And both babies had two uh, variants of HXT, one coming from the mother's side, one coming from the father's side. And I have scores for these variants here. I'm showing highlighted in green. And interesting, they actually sequenced the whole family of these infants, and they figure out that the people in the side of the family that had the 173 mutation actually experienced kidney stones throughout their lifetime without PH1 disease and without the progression to renal failure. So that's another indicative that our scores could recapitulate phenotype and that there's actually a role of HXT in kidney stones without necessarily uh, renal failure. So with this uh, data, I wanted to give you guys some information and how it should be important to consider a minor allele mutation when, make, when making a MAVE, and how this data it, it, using a yeast assay could be important to uh, provide new evidence for VOS reclassification. And I wanted to thank uh, uh, the organizers for inviting me and all my lab. Thank you. Thank you. This is really great. Instead of a minor, oh sorry, Willie Bookser uh, Washu. Uh, instead of a minor allele, is there some other way to like sensitize? Like, is there some toxin, or could you affect it in another way? Because we might not all have a minor allele like that, but. What, what are your ideas to get us there? Because I think that's a, a really good point, how that worked. Yeah, so one of the main limitations of this assay is that I'm only measuring fitness. And I'm measuring fitness really well, but another mechanism for disease is mistargeting. So a second assay that actually look at liver peroxisome cells and look how those variants mislocalize or not could be an important validation. But uh, generally, uh, sorry, can you repeat your question again? Yeah, is there a, an alternative to a minor allele to, to perhaps sensitize? And mm. you know, is that is that what you're doing? Are you finding a way to sensitize it? Is there another way to do that other than having a specific minor allele like this? Oh, I, I understand. Yes. So um, there was, um, I think there are a couple of mutations that also um, sensitize the protein for catalytic defects, not necessarily mitochondria mistargeting. Um, but it's really interesting how uh, the minor allele and major allele works because it's related to ancestry diet. So carnivores and people with ancestry that ate a lot of meat actually have more minor allele presence because it was uh, um, the hydroxyproline from meat goes to the mitochondria. In carnivore mammals, it actually is in the mitochondria, but in herbivores, it goes to the peroxisomes. Question and we do seem to have, I thought I saw a hand. Well, maybe we can catch up in the coffee break. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.